I've told this story before, but it's a perfect ramp for this sermon, so um, act surprised if you know the answer. Uh, it was sixth grade for me. I was 12, just turned 12 years old. Uh, Veterans Day was on Saturday, the 11th of November, and so Friday we had school off because they want to give you a day of school. So, so Thursday, the 9th, I, I went over to Scott Vandiver's house for a sleepover, spend the night. And, you know, sleepovers when you're 12, there's nothing better in the world. I mean, the junk food is the greatest, and, and you run around in the woods and slap each other with fake swords, and, and um, you know, you don't ever sleep at all. But the best thing about sleeping at Scott's house, sleeping over, is Scott had a Nintendo. I didn't even have an Atari. I mean, in, in my day, you had to climb trees to have fun, and, and Scott was way out in front, excited, and we just played video games all night till our thumbs fell off. And our game of choice that night was Super Mario 2, the second one. Well, we'd been playing Super Mario 2 for a while, but we hadn't beaten it because it was a really hard game, and there's that last dragon thing that's really hard. But this was the night to beat Super Mario 2. And we had little calluses on our little soft kid hands, and that was no problem. Thousands of little coins, ding, 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 we'd keep getting, and we'd find these little free, a new life behind little brick walls and, and under mushrooms or wherever the heck they hide in that game, and we got all those new lives, and our little Marios and our little Luigis would, would throw stone after stone after all these like dragons and evil things until eventually, working together, Scott and I, taking turns, we beat the game, and it's still a proud moment of my life. <laughs> We celebrated like little 12-year-olds celebrate. We high fives that kind of miss and little awkward hugs where you're not sure you want to hug another little guy in your little room there. And, 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 and we shared stories about how, oh, man, that level was really close. And then we'd watch the screen with the terrible music and we'd oh, sigh of relief. And we, we'd talk about all those times all year. We were so close to that dragon would get us. And, but we got through it. Or we'd talk about how our other friend had this technique to get through. And they tried it. It never worked. And they always died. But for us, finally... For these few minutes, we basked in the glory of victory. So eventually we turn off the Nintendo, and and y'all, many of you remember that thing, you turn off the Nintendo and and the TV turns right to channel 3, always, I don't know why, Um, and if you're in the book club, you probably already know what was playing on channel 3 when I turned it off, because this was November 9th, and if you do a little math, figuring out Hanson's 37, I was 12, minus that, carried that, skipped a year, started early. Uh, It was 1989, and you're like, November 9th, 1989, oh, we turned the TV off, and we saw the Berlin Wall falling. It was just starting to fall. And we saw people on the screen celebrating with high fives and sighs of relief, because they had worked so hard for so long together, and they had built up calluses of hopelessness in their heart, and and they'd seen people trying to break that wall down, and and they'd seen their enemies conquer them, and they'd seen their enemies conquer their friends, and they were there just celebrating that they'd overcome in victory. Now, this is an actual piece of the Berlin Wall. The Hubbards back there, in 1990, a year later, they went and uh, they were smarter than most people. They didn't just buy some concrete. As I understand, they, they, they rented a chisel and went to the wall themselves and broke it down. So this is the real thing. It's both a symbol and a stanchion of division and injustice defeated. This piece of concrete right here with flecks of stone, big, big stones in there, big pebbles in there, um, destroyed lives. That did. And it nearly brought our entire world into war. Little pause. Um, by the way, back in 1989, um, when the wall was beginning to fall on November 11th, November 11th, 9th, um, the Hubbards had been members of this church for almost 15 years. Uh, this Friday, the 19th of December, will be the Hubbards' 40th anniversary of membership in this church. <laughs> And we, we live in a, in a world full of mobility and indifference and division. And they not only have been members of this church and this community, but you have served our town in so many ways. Jim was a fire chief for I don't know how long. Uh, decisions he made, actions he made, might have saved your house, might have saved your home. Uh, and, and Judy was a treasurer at this church for 25 years. 
Uh, it's her careful foresight that has made it possible for this church family to worship together in, in perpetuity. Uh, Jim's been an elder a few times. Judy's been so active with the Christian women in service. Jim has preached right here. Judy's made so many cookies out there that when there's bad sermons, you can just go eat cookies. I don't know. As long as I've been here, they've sat in those same seats. Have you always sat in those same seats? Yeah? yeah. Uh, Justine, have they always sat beside you? Have you always sat beside them? What, what, do you, what can you tell us about these, these eldest members of the church? Well, I can tell you that they're tremendous folks, and they have served this church wholeheartedly for all of those 40 years. Uh, I haven't known them that long, but I do know some interesting little things about what they've done. Uh, whenever Judy has needed help with CWS, Jim was always there. And the big, the big time that he helps is to get all of the stuff down out of the cupboard for CWS at the time of the July sale. And then he's always here to help us pack it up and put it back up there. I remember when we remodeled the sanctuary here. Jim was in here day after day after day working on the floor, the walls, whatever. Anything that needed to be done around here, those two people have been here to help do it. And I appreciate all their service and I want to say thank you. Let's all say thank you. So they tore this down, and they brought it back. Um, I, you might have seen the TV, but you can imagine what it looked like when this was first falling on that November night. You, you might have heard the sounds. It was probably cheering, and there was ching, 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 and you know, things breaking, and, and, and celebrations, and bottles popping, and all kinds of noises of excitement. You might, have, you might think, you might place yourself in there and think, what did that wall smell like? From 1961 to 1989, when it was standing there, what did it smell like? Uh, all the concrete and the gunpowder and the graffiti paint that might have been sprayed on there. There was nothing alive. There were no plants. There was nothing fresh. You've all been in places where you can smell the tension in the air. You can cut it. It's, it's nauseous. It's acrid. Once in a while in Berlin, there must have been a smell even worse, of blood and of death, as people tried to get across and didn't make it. Now, thank, thank God for me, this is me. I, I don't know what war smells like. I don't know what that level of division smells like. Some of you do, and we thank you who've been in those places with those smells. And we wish you'd never had to go through that. Uh, and we pray that those things will be obsolete someday. Only a few of us know the brokenness and the putridity of war. But I do know what poverty and brokenness smell like. That's what I can speak to. Uh, just a hint of the, of the overall pain. I, I know what it's like in Des Moines. That's where I started to go to college for a couple of years. And I know what it's like to wake up in the morning. We would row, uh, practice rowing on the river, and you'd see the homeless guys uh, getting out of their tents. They slept near the river. That's where they were allowed to sleep in town. Some of the same ones that would be waking up as our coxswain would yell on the speakers, they would come to the homeless shelter, the, the soup kitchen really, where I would go on Tuesdays. Every Tuesday I would try to go down there and, and serve. And you get to know people in that soup kitchen. Uh, a little girl about 10 or 11 at the time, Latina girl, uh, she would come up and take all the old bread at the end of the day. We know people who come and take, take bread. And, and, and here at our food pantry, we have often very, very good, good bread from Whole Foods. There we had the cheapest bread, and it was always old, and it was always a day from being moldy. And I would hand her this bread, and she would walk back and take her two younger sisters, and they would go, I, I don't know. I don't know. I never know what happened to them. I don't know if they made it out of the streets or if the streets took advantage of them in unthinkable ways. But that, those girls are in my memory and that smell of handing them old, moldy bread. And we had a Chinese man there who spoke no English. I think he was Chinese, my best guess. I don't know for sure. He was there every day with this uh, outsized smile, uh, outsized for his for his face, but also for his situation. And when it got cold, that second winter, he showed up, he'd been wearing just a t-shirt, right through the fall, through the windy, windy fall of Iowa, and he showed up one day, and I hate that I laughed, but I just admit to my soul that, that I laughed at this, because he was wearing a sweatshirt that said Kappa Kappa Gamma, KKG. <laughs> if you don't know, that, we used to call that sorority Kappa Kappa Gucci, or Visa Visa MasterCard. Um, and, and maybe it was just our little, little nook. Probably it was because we were intimidated because they were so pretty. Um, but they were a symbol of wealth. 
Big, beautiful sorority house. And now there's this man wearing this shirt every week, getting dirtier and smellier with stains. It was gross. It was a poignant reminder of just how divided our world can be. And if you've spent any time in places like this, you know that a lot of people are just there needing a helping hand at the moment. Just this, I've been in these places, a lot of you have been in these places, needing that helping hand. And that's, that's why I wanted to, to serve there in college. But you also know that when everyone's sitting around that table, you have some people who just, just, just smell, stink of, of cigarettes they've been smoking nonstop. And, and other people whose kerosene breath from their hard night of drinking the night before, and the night before, and the night before. And some have just given up completely on hygiene. And so these rooms develop a stench of brokenness and despair. You see the fear of, when is my next meal going to come after this? Where am I going to sleep tonight? Will it be safe? And you want to do more than just give them food. You want to do more than give them a coat. The fear reeks, and you want to give them hope. You want to give some reason to not be afraid. So in Luke, the angel comes to Mary, and the angel says, Do not be afraid. Same angel, same chapter, comes to Zechariah uh, to tell about... He's about to have a a young boy. We're going to call him John the Baptist. That's Jesus' cousin. And the angel says to Zechariah, Do not be afraid. And in Matthew, the angel comes to uh, to Joseph, Jesus' stepdad. And uh, Joseph is just torn up. He has no idea what to do. I mean, he knows, I can't trust this young woman. I should break the engagement. I really should. Um, But if I do that, she'll end up on the streets, and she'll be begging, and maybe she'll have to sell her body to stay alive. Or worse, or worse, they might throw stones at her until they break her apart. But if I do keep her, Joseph thinks, you know How can I go through this marriage? I'll be a fool. No one will respect me. And my business, I'm a carpenter. The only work I'll ever get is to build those stupid Roman crosses. I don't know what I'm going to do. And the angel comes and says, And so the baby's born in a little stable with animals all around. Would you call that a pleasant smell? Some of us like the smell of, you know, like a good pile of cured manure. Like it kind of, it's all right. You know, a bale of hay is there, sweet earth. But more importantly, there's no doubt that Mary and Joseph have that parental fear with a newborn, and they wonder what's going to happen in his life. But there's nothing sinister in the air at that moment. It's a joyous occasion. And a few days later, they bring the baby into, their, into the church nearby. And it's kind of like a bris on the eighth day. You bring, you bring the baby in there. And, and they probably lit some candles. That's, that's my guess. It's not written in there. Almost certainly lit some candles. Uh, but the Bible does say they made a sacrifice of two turtle doves. That's where we get that from, by the way. Uh, and, and, and if anything smells sacred, I mean, this is, this, is what, this is what sacred smelled like in those days. is lit candles, and they were grilling up a bird. And a little bit later, of course, uh, a little while later, these, these weird guys come from, from out east, astronomers, um, bringing some gifts. And if you, we have, right here is a, is a DVD. We're going to watch this after church to see what the star of Bethlehem was. It's amazing. Tamara Haynes wrote me on Facebook and she said, it changed my faith system. Actually, she had a belief system. Um, so you should come and watch that. It's, it's pretty neat. Judy Hubbard last year afterwards, she just said, awesome. Uh, which, you know, I'd just give that as a, as a plug. Uh, but these guys, they follow the star, and they show up there, and they give them a few gifts, like frankincense, which smells really wonderful. You can come up and smell the candles. It'll be mixed in there with the sweet smell of honey. Out in the fellowship hall, we've got frankincense blowing everywhere. It's a holy oil. It's a calming oil. It's the sort of thing that pushes away fear. It's the sort of thing that draws forth peace. Later, uh, you can imagine Jesus. Little, little, let's say he's eight. Let's just, let's just sanctify imagination. He's eight years old. He's helping out his dad in the carpentry shop. Some of us know what woodworking smells like. You got the, you got the shavings of the wood. They use a lot of cedar out there. That's, that's the main wood that was there. So you got this cedar smell, and, and maybe they've got some oils, some lacquers that they're using to, to make tables, or I don't know what. And... and uh, you know, Joseph had been afraid 
when Jesus was born, but he's a good dad. He's learned how to be a dad. He's good at it. He teaches his, his son a trade, and he teaches his son lessons. And this isn't in the Bible, but maybe one day Jesus is there, eight years old, and Joseph says, you, you, know, you know, boy, look at all this wood. It is better to worry about the two-by-four stuck in your eye rather than the sawdust in someone else's eye. Or maybe Jesus is 13. He's getting a lot better. He's at the work site. They're starting to build a a foundation for a home. And Joseph says, Son, it's always better to put your house on stone rather than sand. Your mother would tell you that's something about faith, but that's up to you and her. Maybe Jesus gets older. He's maybe 17 years old. They're finishing a house. They're putting the last touches on a house, working on the roof, and, and they go down for lunch, and they sit under a palm tree with the shade. They're eating their, their lunch, and you know, 17-year-olds get a little bit curious sometimes. And, and Jesus says, Dad, what, what were you and Mom like before I was born? I, I know about that whole donkey Bethlehem thing, but before that, what were you all like? Dads, there are some tough conversations to have that your kids ask you, and usually the answer is go ask your mother. But we hope in this situation, Joseph would have wondered how to answer sensitively. And he finished chewing his pita bread, and he decided to tell Jesus the truth. Maybe he said, you know, son, you're old enough now to know. Your mom was actually pregnant when we got married. And Jesus' jaw just dropped. And he said further, and son, it, it, it wasn't me. Your mom was pregnant really before I met her. I'm not your birth father. And Jesus says, holy something. <laughs> and we can lay aside, just for a moment, the whole son of God thing. We can lay aside any possibility that Jesus did or didn't have an intuition about his divine origins. But this must have been mind-blowing to find out about his mother and, and, and the father that he knew. And to make matters worse, Jesus had been studying, we know he'd been studying very well Moses' law, the law in that time. He knew that what his dad just told him was a serious legal issue. She could have deserved to, to, to die. Or at least get turned off onto the streets. He knew that if things had gone a little different, he should not have been born. He never would have been there. And so, dads, you know when the kids' wheels are turning in there, and, and you, can almost hear, you can almost hear Joseph say, Son, I, it wasn't right what they were going to do to her. I loved your mom. I loved you. So I took care of her in this delicate situation. Years later, the story that is in the Bible is of another woman caught in adultery. The Bible says caught in the act of adultery. Let your minds go to that. And she is standing there in the middle of town, clutching her tunic, shaking in fear, as men with stones stand all around her, ready to break her. And they say, Jesus, 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 come over here. What do you think we should do to this woman? You know know the law. She had sex before she was married. And you can smell the tension in the air. What was Jesus thinking? Eh, This was just like my mom. This was just like my mom. I don't think I can do this. Y'all go away. First words out of the mouths of angels is almost always, do not be afraid. It's as though whatever special message God has to people, uh, when angels come there, it's a message to all of us not to be afraid of the mysteries of God's plan or the pains of injustice or whatever might happen in, in our lives. And Jesus, more than an angel, more than a messenger of God, continues this tradition not just by saying it, but by bringing peace wherever He comes. He says, judging each other builds walls between us. You can break those walls down instead. Ignorance breeds fear and hatred. You can draw deeper onto the value of love that that forms us all together. That primal desire to hurt hurting people hurts us. So drop your stones and find more peaceful solutions. Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, which means he saves, for he will save his people from their sin. And whatever you think about the Holy Spirit conceiving him, whatever you believe about Jesus dying on a cross later or rising up after that, whatever you believe about sin and forgiveness or heaven and hell, any of that stuff, may I propose simply that we find a hint, a small scent of salvation 
Every time we discover peace in our hearts and every time that we build peace in the world and every time that we break down those walls, let there be peace.